Hello, hello, Parker University. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, when I say Cairo, you say practice. Cairo. Practice. Cairo. Practice. That's what we're going to talk about today, all right? Chiropractic. And I have the distinct honor of being here because, like I told Gordon, every time I come and see the students, it gives me energy. I take back to my office and I blow it out the doors because you guys are our future. So a round of applause to yourself, okay? Okay, so, so bear with me. I'm going to take you on a journey. We're going to go on a journey through chiropractic. We're going to start back in the past, bring you guys up to the present, and we're going to the future. So uh, indulge me, if you will, okay? Who in here knows this gentleman, right? D.D. Palmer. He's the founder of chiropractic, right? So he actually delivered the first chiropractic adjustment uh, to this man. You may know him as Harvey Lillard. He actually owned uh, janitorial service inside of the facility where D.D. Palmer had his office. And what happened is, the story goes, according to Valdelia Simmons, who was the daughter of uh, Mr. Lillard, says that there were some men in a the hallway. They had a conversation. They were involved. It was jovial. And D.D. Palmer was sitting in his favorite chair, reading a book. And he heard the loud conversation. And he wanted to go out and figure out what the conversation was about. He went to the conversation, he indulged, he realized it was very humorous, he got involved, and at the precipice of the conversation, he slapped Harvey Lillard on the back with a book, and they were very, very joyful. A couple of days later, Mr. Lillard came back and said, you know what, D.D., when you slapped me on the back with that book, we had that wonderful conversation, my hearing got a little bit better. D.D. said, well, really? Let's see what we can do about that. And then he started to work with Dr. Well, Dr. Lillard, Harvey Lillard to figure out what corrected his hearing. That, my friends, is the true story, according to Vidalia Simmons, of how chiropractic was founded. All right? And there you see the adjustment there. You may have heard a different story in your, in your classes. But as you can see, Mr. Lillard was lauded. He was brought to every single uh, assembly they would have, and he was given a seat in the front row. And they would address him as Mr. Harvey Lillard. So he was an African-American man, and he was brought into the chiropractic profession because of his role as the first chiropractic patient. One thing, though, he really wanted to play a bigger role in the profession of chiropractic. He wanted to have his children and children's children be a part of a profession that he helped start. But unfortunately, because of the times and the social ramifications of the day, they did not allow African Americans or colored individuals inside of University of Chiropractic. And this, my friends, are, uh, is application of Palmer College of Chiropractic. And it read on the bottom, no Negroes allowed. So unfortunately, chiropractic, the profession, was discriminating against the very person on which the back of chiropractic was founded. Doesn't really seem right, does it? But, however, there were still some African Americans who got a chance to go to chiropractic college. This is Palmer College's Lyceum. And if you can look up to the top right, you'll see that there's an individual of darker pigmentation. This individual is African. Well, how did he get to go to the chiropractic college? And they did not allow African Americans. Well, they did allow individuals from other countries who may have spoken other languages to go to their schools, but they did not allow African Americans to go to chiropractic colleges. Very strange. Well, how then, we know that there were African American chiropractors who came out of school, how did they get educated? This is how they got educated, through correspondence. Let me ask you, first quarter students, 10th quarter students, well, a couple made up the quarter, could you understand, articulate, and integrate the knowledge if you had to learn everything through a correspondence course. They sent your books in the mail, say go learn chiropractic. Wouldn't quite be the same, would it? No. But that's, they had the desire to be a chiropractor so much they did that. Not only that, they formed their own schools. In Washington, D.C., this is Central Chiropractic College, uh, 1923. They had African American colleges set aside, separate, but not equal. This is the exterior of Rubell College in, in uh, 
Chicago. This was founded actually by an African American, one of the first African Americans to be licensed as a chiropractor because he went to one of the African American schools, Mr. Rubel. But he wanted to make sure that he had all types of people in his college. So he integrated. He had uh, African American and Caucasian and predominantly people speaking inside of his school and the faculty was mixed as well. So he made sure it was integrated. He knew that having an integrated school would be a better education for our doctors of chiropractic in the future. These individuals here are the founders of the first African American association called the Interstate uh, Chiropractic Association. And they were very, very vital in making sure that African Americans were qualified and African Americans were accepted into these universities. So they still, however, only had to go to predominantly African American universities, but they were working on integrating. You see, they are actually men of service. They are Navy men. Now, this is a theme, common theme that you'll see over and over, that we first go to uh, the services to integrate, and then it's accepted throughout the rest of American society. But let's bring it back home. B.J. Palmer, how did he feel about discrimination? He is quoted as saying he does not agree with discrimination. He said, you know what? Give me a spine, not the color of skin, but rather give me a spine. I'll set the world on fire. So he knew that if you were actually to spread chiropractic throughout the globe, which he talked about often, you had to get chiropractic in different demographics and different areas. Think about it. The globe is made up of different nationalities, isn't it? So you have to spread it through the world. All right? So why would you keep a, a great thing like chiropractic just confined to one area? All right? This is Clarence Reaver. Clarence Reaver was on faculty at Palmer. He said, you know, Mr. Palmer, I have a, a very promising African-American lady who I think will be a great chiropractor. I really, really want her to come to school. I talked to BJ. BJ said, you know what, that's fine, that's great. But there's one thing, you know, I'm not sure how well the students would accept that. So he said, you know what, I'll put it to a vote. Let's be fair. Let's be democratic. I'll go to the students and say, students, I have this promising young lady, highly qualified, very educated. We want her to come and be a part of your constituents, your colleague. Would that be okay? However, he had a very large southern population who did not agree with having a person of color in their school. They said, if you allow her to come to school, we're going to walk out. Well, BJ being the businessman he is, realized that if a large contingency of this population walked out, they might not be financially stable. So he said, no, African Americans can be allowed. So Mr. Reaver said, you know what? It's quite all right. I'm going to start my own school. And that's what he did. So BJ was sympathetic. He said, look, I understand. I agree with you. I just can't do it for political and financial reasons. However, I will give you the faculty you need. I will make sure that people understand and know and publicize your school such that it will exist. The very first class consisted of one Caucasian and two African Americans. They kept that same uh, ratio throughout the entire time they were in existence. And there you can see the Reaver School of Chiropractic from 1945 to 1951. Very interesting, right? They were doing well until 51. What happened in 51, right? World War II, what happened then? You start having people come back and they start having the GI Bill. Oh, what's the GI Bill? Well, they start paying for the veterans to go to school. And guess what? Some of those veterans were African American. So now the inter interstate school came and they started accepting African Americans to go to their school. So some of the guys from the Reaver School went to the interstate school, okay? But then guess what? They start getting populated, start doing well. So the predominant schools start saying, you know what? I want part of this GI Bill, so I need to start accepting African Americans to qualify. And that's exactly what they did, right? So you start seeing that the schools start changing their tunes once they realized that it was financially beneficial for them to start accepting African Americans. And it was because of GI Bill, right? And there were some other people, Dr. Lavender, who, were, who was up in New Jersey, who actually, New Jersey was withheld from the State Board of Chiropractic because they had cited the uh, restrictive practices of chiropractic schools by not allowing African Americans to be in school. They barred New Jersey from having a Board of Chiropractic. Well, Dr. Lavender worked to all the chiropractic colleges and said, look, you are hurting New Jersey by your practices. Please change your practices. And all this restrictive practices of discriminating against African Americans, they slowly start doing that. And 
in turn, they start being allowed for financial aid, and now you start having African Americans graduate from places like Parker. Wonderful. Now they start advertising for African Americans in their books, right? And now you start getting African Americans be acknowledged in their board and state associations. And I'll go through quickly. But this is how the change has occurred. And they start, stop discriminating chiropractors. This is Alabama, 1979. And he was the chiropractor of the year. So now we start being integrated. And now chiropractic is accepting diversity, right? I am here because this man right here, Dr. Bobby Westbrook, all right? He established the American Black Chiropractic Association back in 1981. He had a bus and took people there together. And what it is basically, it's an affinity group, right? He understood that individuals may have been going to these primary schools, but they needed support and understand that they were in the right place. So he made sure all the African Americans from the United States had a meeting place. Back in 1982, they were chartered with their first meeting. A very good date, I assume, because that's the date that Parker was founded, 1982. So things have been changing. Things are working, all right? So I am walking in his footsteps to continue uh, telling individuals that it is important to make sure that minorities are represented in chiropractic. So every year we have a convention. This is one of our very first conventions in Texas. All right? And here is one again. We had one in 1988. Dr. Gloria Niles, who has been the president as well, and also Dr. Glass, who has been president several times as well, and the ACA president pictured here. Then they start having summits. Uh, 1990, there shows a couple of our presidents in uh, Palmer, trying to figure out how can we integrate and bring more minorities into chiropractic, all right? This gentleman right here was the president of the California Chiropractic Association. And he has a very interesting quote. He said, the first adjustment bonded the African-American community and the chiropractic community forever. He said, both communities have suffered injustice, discrimination, and prejudice. Let that sink in for a minute, right? As chiropractors, are we predominant in healthcare? No. So what happens when we talk about chiropractic and everybody should be adjusted, and we understand that adjusting helps health? When you're going out to speak to maybe a medical doctor, will they look at you as you are what? You're less than. What is he talking about? I don't understand that. It's the same way. You're a minority. And sometimes it's not just a minority. They look, think you're talking a different language, right? So you're a minority and you're foreign, right? But he says, look. We have more in common than we have in differences, okay? So I think that's a very, very powerful quote, by the way. And now we're talking about chiropractic, 100-year anniversary, right? We've been there as well. And then we had a, a convention in, in Jamaica. Jamaica, man, very nice. And uh, so that was very well attended. And now, because of this, I am part of the Chiropractic Summit. Who in here knows about the Chiropractic Summit by show of hands? Very, very important. I wish that every single hand would, would come up when I say that. This, my friends, is what's helping you, future doctors of chiropractic, pave the way for your future, right? This is all of the chiropractic university presidents come in one meeting at one time. This is the Congress State of Chiropractic Association coming in one meeting. This is the Association of Chiropractic Colleges all coming in one meeting. And we come together as a professional, as leaders, as big wigs in chiropractic, to say, you know what? We're going to decide the future of chiropractic together, in unity, not divided, speaking in one voice, one message. We're paving the way for your future. We've done some phenomenal things. This particular one was the 22nd Chiropractic Summit. We established chiropractic as a drug-free profession, unanimously. Can I please get a round of applause for that? You know, you may hear things, you may get all sorts of emails and all crazy stuff on the internet, but you should not believe that. We had both national associations agreeing of what chiropractic is. You first have to know who you are before you can affect the lives of others, right? So we know who we are as chiropractic, so that, that's phenomenal. And I was there, I'm a little spot there in the side. See me over there? I'm, but anyway. Also, we have a brand new website. This is the website we've created to use technology. And by the way, did I say that we're going to San Juan, Puerto Rico next month? <laughs> Woohoo! Not too late. You can book now, all right? So, abcacairo.com. And then this is my current board. These individuals all have practices. 
I have a busy practice as well, so we donate our time. It's a volunteer, right? We don't get paid for this. I do this out of my love, okay? This is very important. And, you know, if you're a student leader, give yourself a round of applause. Because, I mean, God, God, you're already in school, and you're taking time out to help your other fellow students. All the student leaders, round of applause. Thank you very much. You know what? You heard of Prado's Law, right? 80-20 rule, right? 20% of the people do 80% of the work. That's real. Right, so these people who are leaders now will continue to be leaders in the future. It's who you are, right? But being a chiropractor, you're automatically a leader anyway in your profession, but this is what you do. So sharpen your skills now so when you get out, you can have even greater skills that will benefit you in the future. So hats off to all these people here on my board who, who are doing this, again, out of the love of their heart, okay? Did I mention that we're going to San Juan, Puerto Rico? Oh, okay, that's right, yeah, we're going, there we go. All right, now let's talk about this. That's the past. Let's talk about the present. And then we'll talk about the future as well. All right? But you have to know where you're going. So you have to know where you've been. You have to know where you are. All right? We're going to think about this in several different levels. I like to think there's everything is relatable, right? There's three different visions to everything. Now, in your clinical skills, what are you doing with your patients? All right? You're first finding out their history and then they're, how they present presently, and then figuring out what their prognosis is going to be. Right? So you have to consider the whole person right? and where they come from and, and, and what, how they present to you and what will be their possibilities. All right? As for yourself, right? everybody has a different story. Nobody found chiropractic the same way. Some people are legacies. They had their mother or their father who are chiropractors. Right? But there are some people who just discovered chiropractic and they decided to come to the school to figure out, and now they're here. You know what? It doesn't matter. We're all headed on the same path with the same purpose, right? But this is part of you understanding and diagnosing the situation and helping your patients in the future. So what do you have to do? You need a roadmap, GPS, right? You heard of that before? Right? Many people use Google. I love Google. I'm out of town like now. Anywhere I want to go, type it in, boom, I get there. I know where I am, and I know my destination. But you have to begin with the end in mind, right? So right now, as, as student doctors, you have to be thinking actively, how do I want to practice? Well, how do you know what you're going to practice unless you go find out how other people practice, right? So you should be out going out and visiting active doctors of chiropractic. It just makes sense, right? So I encourage you to do that. That's beginning with the end in mind. You'll figure out exactly what type of chiropractor you want to be by seeing successful individuals practicing now. And believe you me, they're out there, and they're waiting for you to knock on their door. Guess what they're doing? They're busy adjusting, be, busy being successful. So they're just waiting on you to say, hey, please te teach me, mentor me. They will open the door for you, 100%. So this is more like a PSA, right? You know a PSA, philosophy, science, and art. But you have to call out to your community. And think about every patient you're going to adjust as their psyche, right? You're dealing with their psyche, the mindset of the individual, whatever they go through on a daily basis, right? Their soma, their body, what is their body doing? But then you also have an aura or a spirit, because every person's spirit you have to address. And if you're not doing that, you may not be giving that person the entire part of the health that you can help them. All right? So it's all about three different levels. And of course, you've heard about this, the philosophy, the science, and the art that we have as chiropractic. What, what is the philosophy of giving somebody healthy? What's the science of delivering the thrust, of actually being on the correct segment, of actually going in and addressing the entire spine? But then what's about the art of healing, right? And not only that, when you get into practice, what about the art of making money? Because you're not just doing this just to help, but you have to be successful, right? So there's always three different levels you look at something. So look at things very, very in-depthly, please. And last but not least, as a student, what does that mean to you, right? How does all this apply to me, right? What are we talking about? What are your goals? GPS also stands for goals, priorities, and strategies. Now here's it's saying goals, priorities, and success. But what are your specific goals? What do you want to do? Most of you will say, sure, I want to graduate, right? Hopefully, everybody, everybody will graduate, by the way, right? So that's your goal. Well, you know what? There's going to be some quote unquote obstacles. You got to pass a test, you got to take the, the boards, you got to take OSCEs. Yeah, all that's there. But guess what? It's not an obstacle, it's a stepping stone. It's put there to help you. So you, it's how you look at it. Whatever your perception is, is going to be what your outcome is. So use that to actually 
lift you, right? And it's meant to help you. So look at it as such. And then develop your priorities. If you know you have a test, right? You should not be out late. You should not be uh, looking at TV, quote unquote, entertainment, quote unquote, I call it a lot of things, but it is not healthy, right? Don't be involved in what quote unquote society is because you're no longer there. You are different, by the way. So you have to act it. Set your priorities such that it is in line with your goal. And that will lead you to success. That is your roadmap to success. You know what? Everybody has a syllabus. Everybody knows what's, what is coming. I know right now these wonderful faculty members provide you with everything, a plan for you to have to be successful. It's there. They want you to do it. They're waiting on you to follow that map. And they will lead you exactly where they want you to be. Okay? So it's there. What are you going to do? You've got to be smarter. Right? You've got to set your goals, goal setting. Right? You first have to be specific. What do I want to do? I want to make a 97.5. Don't want to have a, a B. You don't plan to have a C on a test, do you? Hopefully not. You plan to have an A, all right? So that's your specific goal. Then it has to be something that is measurable, right? How much do I want to make? Well, maybe it's not just that. Let's see. Maybe I want to see 200 patient visits a week as a doctor. That's specific, all right? I can measure that, all right? Great. Now you look at it and say, is that attainable? Well, great, I can do that. But if I'm seeing two patients a week, I might not want to make it at 200 off the rip, right? But it, wherever you are in your academic career, right, you know where you are and what your knowledge base is now, and you want to increase that by 50%, that's attainable. But let's be realistic about it, okay? And then it has to be relevant to you, relevant or realistic. So is this something that is important to you now, right? Not talking about six months from now, not talking about a year from now. Is it relevant to you now? So wherever class you're in right now, that's relevant. So guess what? Set your goals accordingly. Don't think about how many patients you're gonna get if you're currently in you know, anatomy or X-rad. You need to figure out the X-ray first. First things first, all right? Then it needs to be time sensitive. Don't say I'm gonna do it someday. Set a fine date to your goal and you'll be achievable by, I'm gonna do this by next week. At seven o'clock, I will accomplish this particular goal. That's how you do it. Priorities, this is big to me. Because you cannot hang out with the same people you used to hang out with if you want to be successful. Success breeds success, all right? If your friends, your circle of influence you're hanging out with, and you're the most successful person in that particular group, guess what? Time for you to find a new group. Always choose people who are doing better than you to hang out with, all right? Because their priorities are going to be higher than yours, and now you can start fine-tuning what you are doing by looking at what they are doing. If people you're hanging out with have bad priorities and they're doing bad things, guess what? Bad habits breed bad habits. So, you know, Pookie and Ray Ray, they cool and all, but I can't hang out with you no more. I'm sorry, right? I, 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 gotta, I gotta be a doctor. You're not gonna be a doctor. I'm gonna be a doctor. I'll see y'all later, okay? So, what are your strategies? How are you gonna do this? I mean, do you like studying groups? You could get a group. Make sure they're smarter than you, right? And you start contributing. But me, I wasn't like that. I'm a visual person, if you can't tell. I like audiovisual. I had to go into the library, and I'd be by myself in a little cubby hole, and I played a video, and I'd memorize it. I know it. I go to my test, boom, good grade. After the test, don't talk to me about what the wrong score was. I don't care. You know, I don't want to hear that. That's not, that was me. Each person, his own. But know what works for you. Right? Find out your own strategy, and if it works, use it. Okay? Good. Now, where are you now in your goal? I had a goal. My goal was I wanted to run a marathon. And I was 68 years old, and I really was running maybe three miles or so. But if someone asked me, you're never going to run a marathon. I said, no, I'm going to do it. I had friends who were doing triathlons, and I see them on Facebook. I said, I went to school with that joker. He running, I, if he can do it, I can do it. So I said, let's see how I have to do it. I had to look online, develop a plan, see how many miles I had to run, leading up until the, the final date. And the day I turned 40, the day after, I actually ran the marathon. There are four Ps I had to do. The first one was I had to plan. I mapped out my course. A year and a half ahead of time, how many miles I run this week, and then the next week, and the next month, I knew exactly what I had to do. 
Four times a week, this is that. And now I have my goal. The second thing I had to do was I had to practice. I couldn't just go run a marathon cold. I had to practice every day. And I don't care if I was tired. I didn't care if it was raining. I didn't care if somebody told me I had to do something. No, four days a week, I had to get out there and run because this was part of my plan. I did that. And then after I got that particular point and I was up to maybe 19 miles of running, right? I said, okay, all this thing say, I don't have to run a whole 26.2 miles. They said, run about 20 and you're okay. I was cool, but I had to prepare. I had to get the right shoes, had to get the right outfit, had to get, had to get the right cap, had to get everything. Because psychologically, I had to be ready. And I had all my little uh, packets of energy and all that stuff. And I got down to the event, and sure, the day before, I did not sleep one wink. I was nervous as a wreck. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't care. But when it was time to go, I was sure there. I got up and I went. You have to be there. I had to show up. I, I didn't fear it. I, I was ready. And then when I was there, the last P you had to do, you have to persevere. So this is what I did. I started running. And I was good. The first 13.1 miles, I was cruising. I was on my own. I got to mile 17. And a little something, they told me something, but I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't understand it until I experienced it. But boy, my toes start hurting, okay? And I was like, this is unreal, this is ungodly. I can't do it, I can't do it. And so I started walking, and then I was like, man, what's gonna happen? And what happened? Sure enough, God always brings somebody along. This lady said, what are you doing? I said, my feet hurt. <laughs> she was like, no, keep running. I said, why, my feet hurt? Keep running, they hurt. They'll stop hurting if you run. Really? They'll stop hurting if you run. Okay, so I, I started running, and what happened? My feet stopped hurting, right? And I was doing good a couple of miles, but guess what? My, I got to thinking again. My mind got to me. I'm not finished yet. Guess what? My feet hurt again. Oh, shoot, I'm going to stop. So I stopped again, and what happened? Another person came along. Hey, buddy, you going to run with me? My feet hurt. Come on, run. My feet hurt. You can do it. And I ran. And my feet stopped hurting, and I did it, and I finished. You understand? And, and I thought about it. God brings everything to life for a reason. This is exactly what you will go through as a chiropractic student. This is exactly what you will go through when you're in practice. You are going to have a plan and do it. You're going to start it. You're going to be ready. You'll be hyped up, and you're cruising. All of a sudden, something comes along. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. Oh, shoot, I'm going to stop. No, don't stop. God will bring somebody along to encourage you. You can do it. You can make it. Keep running, keep running, and you'll graduate. All right, commencement. I graduated. Woohoo! Guess what? What does commencement mean, by the way? Beginning. <laughs> so guess what? There's a thing called you can recover on your feet. Slow down, party, whatever, but guess what? Now it's time to get running and start it and go and get in practice. Oh, my goodness, it's hard. I got overhead. Yeah, whatever. Keep running. They will come, and the patient, you will succeed. Just don't stop running. Anything worth having is not easy. If it was easy, everybody would have it, right? That's the definition. So you can do it. You just got to keep to it. And find people with your same goals in mind. I mentioned it before, but like minds breed like minds. And unfortunately, your parents and your family are not really the like minds when you're in chiropractor. Because you can't build your business on family and friends. It will not happen. You have to learn to communicate chiropractic effectively. And the people who need it will want it, and they will pay you handsomely for it. They are there. You just have to go out and learn how to communicate that skill, and they'll come to you. Okay. That is our mission and purpose of the American Black Chiropractic Association. It says, we want to integrate and improve persons of color entering the profession of chiro doctor of chiropractic. And all chiropractors, by my light, are colorful people. <laughs> because everybody in chiropractic is also matter. If you're a chiropractor, you're colorful. So anybody, everybody can be a member of the American Black Chiropractic Association. What we want to do is take black persons, right, and qualified, and put them in positions where they'll succeed as chiropractors. And that's it. And we want to have an a, a, uh, area where we can exchange and facilitate knowledge and research in chiropractic. And we want to promote and support our students by having the, the Harvey Scholarship. Uh, and we have our student American Black Chiropractors 
If you are in the SABCA, you need to apply for this scholarship. We only have a couple of applicants. It is time for you to apply before February 31st. My last pitch. Okay. So now the question, real, the real question is, how does it apply to the world? What percentage of people should receive chiropractic? Let me hear you. 100%. Now let that sink in. You believe it because you said it. I know you do. But the world is made up of every single demographic there is, isn't it? All different types of people. Some of them have different cultures, some in different lands. So what do we need to do in the education of chiropractors? Educate all types of doctors of chiropractic, go out to all different areas of the world to bring the message of chiropractic, right? So I looked at a percentage, I said, wow, that's big. I believe in that. I want that to happen. But when I look back, I say, how many are in my special demographic, African Americans? Would you believe there's less than 1% of doctors of chiropractic are African American? And the population in the U.S. is 13.5 at least. We're not even similar to the population of the U.S. So there was my charge. I said, that needs to change. I care deeply about my community. I want my community to be healthy. I, want, I know my community needs chiropractic. They need to be adjusted. That's what I want to do. What do you want to do? Do you want to go out and reach your community? Want to help your people? How many percent? Right now, chiropractic has utilization rate maybe around 8 or 10. Some people saying 14. We're saying we had a, a whole thing to drive it above 18. That's good. But guess what? Am I, it's not enough. We need everybody to be chiropractic. Everybody be adjusted. You understand? So it's bigger than you and me. Now you look at the whole diversity and growth thing, and that's what you have to do. If you want to grow, you must diversify. If you have an investment, right, and you're investing in stocks, you don't put all of your investment in one particular section. You don't put everything in precious metals. I put all my money in precious metals. Guess what? You won't grow. The profession of chiropractor needs to grow. We have to diversify. We have to make sure that all different demographics, all different areas are exposed to chiropractic. And that means we have more chiropractors. That's how we grow. And of course, Parker is taking his part in doing this. And they understand that. The board knows this very, very well. And that's what we're doing, is trying to diversify. And as a student population, I know you receive everybody with welcome arms because you understand this is your colleague. This person next to you is going to help change the world. We should welcome that. Now think about this as a profession, of the doctor of chiropractic. Are we a minority in the healthcare profession? Yes, we're a minority. So guess what? We have work to do within our profession of healthcare. They look at us, they marginalize us, and they say that we're not worthy, we're not equal. That is not true, that's further from the truth. All of our outcomes are better, all of our patient satisfactions are higher, right? We are the future. They're waiting on us. The world is waiting on us. The American society is shifting from the old pain to wellness and understanding what healthcare is all about. We need to lead that fight. That's what we do. As a matter of fact, the summit put together this. Who's heard of 2706? Very good, the same smart people raise their hand. We need more people raising their hand. This is part of the Affordable Care Act. We work together to create a resolution where it says, if you're a health care provider, no matter what you do, it will not be discriminated upon. Let me read it to make sure I'm giving justice to this, OK? A group of health care healthcare plan for health care insurance offering group individual health insurance coverage shall not discriminate with respect to the participation under the plan and coverage against any health care provider who is acting within the scope of that provider's license and certification under applicable state law. That means, my friends, that chiropractic will get paid the same if you're doing this, the same procedure as a medical doctor for providing that service. That is our way of making sure that we are equal. Can I please get a round of applause for that? <laughs> the summit, we're doing this for you, the future of chiropractic. We're making sure you have an equal and level playing field, right? This is the Affordable Care Act. No matter what you think about that, right, it's there. It's law, right? Now, what else we got going on? We have, 
We have veterans health care bill going on right now that you should be aware of and be sure you get some co-sponsors. But we currently have a campaign right now for Medicare and making sure we have equality within Medicare. Right. And making sure doctors of chiropractic get paid for everything up under your state law in Medicare. So do me a favor right now. Everybody has smartphones, right? Go to the ACA website, ACA Today, and you should be signing this, position, this petition right now to make sure that we expand, right, chiropractic and Medicare. ACAToday.com and fill this out. By the way, I know all of you are on Facebook, right? Who in here has more than 1,000 friends on Facebook? Show of hand. One, two, three. I see. All right, very good. All you have to do is post this on your Facebook page. If you get 10% of those people to sign this petition, we are making a change. Because that represents thousands of different uh, uh, votes when they see those people sign that petition. This is how things get done. I'm there in Washington every year pushing for these pieces of legislation. We need your help. You must organize. This is our, this is our civil professional rights. There's a movement now. As a chiropractor, you need to be ahead in that movement. And by the way, who led the civil rights movement? Was it professionals leading the civil rights movement? It was students. So if you guys want change, you can affect change. I think the student chiropractors need to get on board. That's what I'm saying. So let's do that. Guess what? The future are in your hands. If you want it, you can change it. So think about that. I have no doubt I'm speaking to future leaders of chiropractor right now. You guys show up. You guys are here. You will be leading us, and I am confident that chiropractic is in the right hands. So remember, when you're holding that little baby's world in your hand, delivering that adjustment, you're affecting their future. When you hold that mother of four or seven babies and you're adjusting her neck, providing that life-giving force inside her body so she can go out and be a wonderful mother to them, you're affecting their future. That grandmother, she's trusting you. This is your future. You have chosen a wonderful profession that will provide for you, your family, and your future. All I'm saying is, please give back. And thank you for loving what I love, and thank you for loving chiropractic.